My guest at this time is Mark Mix, president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. Mark joins us often when the right to work debate reaches the front pages, and even sometimes when it doesn't. But as we head into Labor Day weekend, we want to get a sense of where things stand in this debate, particularly since the June Supreme Court decision, which ruled that non-union members who work for public sector entities do not have to pay union dues. So what's been the fallout of that, and where does the battle go from here? We'll talk about a lot of different aspects of this. And, Mark, thanks so much for being with us. Greg, it's a pleasure to be on with you and a pleasure to talk about a Supreme Court case where an individual's courage uh, stood up and and the Supreme Court said that First Amendment protections apply when it comes to union force fees. So it is great to talk about that on this Labor Day, and thanks for the opportunity to do so. Well, how has that decision now, roughly two months ago, changed the landscape for this debate? Well, first of all, in in the states that do not have right-to-work laws, in the 23 states that don't have right-to-work laws, every single government employee in the country is now protected from being fired from their jobs for failure to tender dues or fees to a private organization, i.e. a labor union. So the idea that the First Amendment is being defended for those workers, that's the first and, and most important benefit of the Janus decision. It doesn't stop anyone from joining a union. It doesn't stop anyone from supporting a union or giving their entire paycheck to a union. It just says you can't be compelled, and that is a change from a 40-year-old Supreme Court decision that was wrongly decided back in 1977 that continued to allow union officials to have a worker fired for failure to tender dues or fees. So in the public sector, every worker is protected. So that's the big news. The second element of that is exercising uh, those rights and getting educational uh, information out to individuals in those states that heretofore were compelled to pay those fees so that they know what they can do. If they want to stay in the union, they can, but they can't be compelled. And so getting information out, and that's been a primary task of the foundation and, and several groups across the country in informing public sector workers about their rights. And, and public sector workers listening to this can find out uh, at a website called My org, what their rights are under that. And we've gotten lots of people calling in and, and hitting that website and, and exercising their rights across the country. So lots happening. Uh, there's more to do. We've got some litigation that we think is going to allow non-members like Mark Janus and those that were compelled to pay across the country to actually get back some of the money they were forced to pay. So that's an exciting angle of this case as well. I know it's only been a couple of months here, Mark, but uh, what are you seeing from these non-union employees in the public sector? Uh, Are they actually refusing now to, to pay those dues now that they have the option not to? Yeah, I think we are. And in fact, I mean, the evidence of the Janus decision and its impact are really not in yet. We'll start to get reports as union fi- unions file reports across the country. And here in, in Washington, we'll get an idea of, of what some of the impact has been. But for example, a case study in, in Wisconsin, a state that in 2011 reformed their bargaining laws and actually gave right to work to public, public employees out there, and then passed a right to work law in 2015 for every employee in the state of Wisconsin, we have found in some local unions, over 67 percent of the workers have decided to exercise their rights under the right to work protections that exist in the state. That's the type of protection that's now offered to every government employee in every state across the country. And I don't know if the evidence will be the same, and it really doesn't matter. The fact is, Greg, that these workers now have the choice, and that's really the important element of it. If they decide to exercise those rights, that's that's great. If they don't, that's great, too, for the unions. But I think what what, what has happened is – Individual workers, as they find out about their rights, they're the ones that get to hold union officials accountable. In Wisconsin, the union officials there haven't responded too well to these these new freedoms of the workers they claim to represent. So I anticipate there'll be lots of folks interested in this. There have been already. We have uh, 20 lawyers over here that are receiving phone calls and giving advice. We've got that website I mentioned, myjanusrights.org. We've got an 800 number that people are calling in. And I can tell you, uh, information requests have been robust here at the Right to Work Foundation. Have you seen any sort of effort by uh, unions to make sure that only union members are hired by these public sector uh, (laughs) jobs? Absolutely. Greg, you're uh, you're spot on in your analysis of what the other side is trying to do. Instead of trying to go out and figure out how they better serve workers that can now join them voluntarily, they are trying to establish workarounds. In fact, in seven states, they've passed laws that they think – are going to stop people from exiting the union. Uh, you know, they like in California, you have a requirement that you attend a full day seminar, uh, training session, orientation session that you it is mandatory for you to attend, and you have to sign all this paperwork. and And guess who the meeting's run by, Greg? 
It's run by the union. So uh, there's lots of ways to do this. They're, New York has put uh, some language in their budget bill that they think steps around it. Uh, Delaware's passed a bill. Hawaii's passed a bill that they think is, is, a, is a silver bullet to stop the, the people from exercising their rights. But it's interesting. All of these efforts on their part are, are going back to government, trying to use government as a hammer or as a, if you will, a fence to keep these people in as opposed to finding a way to better serve them so that more people will join voluntarily. Uh, so that's no surprise, and we're continuing to, to look at that. We, we have uh, got some people that have called us, and we're looking to litigate against some of these bills, and we probably will before this is all over. Yeah, sounds like you've got quite a bit of legal work ahead of you in some of these states. Mark, you mentioned earlier that there are 23 states in this country that are not right-to-work states. Missouri nearly became the latest one to do that, but came up short in an important referendum in early August uh, when voters shot down the opportunity to make Missouri a right-to-work state. The polls leading up to that vote were pretty lopsided against the idea. Ultimately, why did that happen? Well, it, what, what happened, just a little bit of background on Missouri, the, the Missouri legislature and uh, then-Governor Eric Greitens passed and signed legislation back in 2017. Unfortunately, the right-to-work law never went into effect because Missouri has a, a veto, what, what's called a veto referendum where union officials there and other parties there can go out and get a certain requisite number of signatures and stop the enforcement of a statute that has been passed by the legislature and signed by the governor. Union officials did that. Um, the threshold was very low. It's basically around 99,000 signatures they had to have to stop this and had to be distributed in certain percentages across the state. But those are details that are not really that important. The union did that. The right to work law never went into effect. It was on the books as a statute, but it wasn't enforced, and union officials were still able to force workers to pay dues or fees to get or keep a job. That ballot question was in August, on August 7th, they, in the primary election, and union officials were able to, to defeat – uh, the enforcement of the right to work law. So the right to work law is not in effect, even though it did mm. pass the legislature. Um, so that was moved to the primary ballot in August 7th, and unions did win that vote. But that's not going to stop the folks of Missouri from continuing debate right to work. I suspect, and we've talked to legislators there, that are going to reintroduce the bill in the next session. Uh, politicians are probably be a little bit more wary of the right to work law since there's been a, a, a referendum on it. But union officials spent over $20 million to defend their privileges of forcing workers to pay dues. Uh, the pro right to work side estimates it's about spending about $2.9 million in their case. And i got to tell you, Greg, the distortions about right to work were so amazing. The only thing that Dignan had talked about was a right to work law simply saying that you couldn't be compelled to pay dues or fees to a union to get or keep a job. Everything else uh, the union officials put up was about anything else about it um, than, than the freedom that right to work laws provide. So more work to do in Missouri, but 27 states do have right to work laws that are functioning and providing not only opportunity, but economic and individual freedom to workers across the country. The last topic for you, Mark, before we let you go, uh, as you well know, the, the U.S. Senate shortened its uh, summer recess. Uh, they were back in session for the second half of August mainly looking to advance uh, a number of different nominations, both in terms of personnel as well as judicial nominations. And in order to grease the skids for getting about 15 different judicial nominations towards the path of confirmation, the Republicans agreed, and I guess President Trump agreed, to renominate a guy named Mark Gaston Pierce to the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, and uh, from what I read, he's not a big fan of the work uh, and the positions that you hold. So what's your reaction to all this? Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely right. Mark Gaston Pierce, the former chairman under the Obama National Labor Relations Board, probably did more to advance the issue of forced unionism and union power over workers than any other NLRB member in recent history. We were disappointed that he was renominated. His term expired on August 27th, and we encouraged the president not to renominate him. But the deal, the deal, if 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 I understand it, and I don't think all the details have been out come out yet, Greg. But you're right. I mean, the negotiation was okay. We'll trade one guy. This is how important this seat is to the, to the organized labor officials in the Democrat Party, because the money that flows from their forced use privileges, they're willing to trade one member of the National Labor Relations Board for whatever it is, filling up the Department of Labor, ad adding federal judges. That shows you how important this is. Now, obviously, there's a fight left in this. Pierce has to win a nomination or confirmation in the Senate. Uh, we are committed to battling him in the Senate all the way down to the wire. We anticipate this will be something that comes up probably before the Senate recesses this year, but we're going to be ready to fight it, and I think that once the American people know who this person is, they will encourage their senators to vote against him as well. So a lot more left in that battle, but it was a little disappointing that he's back up and, and potentially could serve on the board for another five-year term. Boy, Mark, it's just a shame you're not busier with more issues to deal with. <laughs> 
Well, thanks, Greg. There's a lot to do, and but it's an exciting time for sure. I mean, the fact that we're debating in the in in the broad-based public domain the issue of compulsory unionism is a really exciting thing. And uh, 15 years ago, you know, people didn't want to talk about it. Now it's a major topic and one that people are paying attention to. So that's good news, and thank you for spreading the word about this and and having a debate about right to work. We appreciate that for sure. Absolutely, Mark. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Greg. Mark Mix is the president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. I'm Greg Columbus reporting for Radio America.